Hi, everyone. Um, this is the session after the lunch. Um, back home, we have a culture of sleeping uh, after a good uh, lunch. I don't know how good your lunch was. <laughs> but if you sleep, I won't blame. My name is Subhashish. Um, I was thinking of waiting for a few more minutes, and people might come in. But uh, as of you saying no, uh, <laughs> and I trust your experience. Uh, this is a presentation about uh, a project that I started uh, a few years back, and it is to build uh, authority-controlled data for Wikipedia and Wikisource. Um, so um, the two parts of the presentation. I've done this before once recently during the uh, Wiki workshop, which is um, sort of a conflict for researchers within the Wikimedia movement. Um, and, uh, uh, and I thought I'll change things slightly, but there are two parts. The first part is about uh, looking at the socioeconomic aspects that impact uh, authority control data, and then, uh, and then looking at the um, authority control data in the Wikimedia context. So um, do all of you know what authority control data is here? Anyone who doesn't know? Yeah, OK. OK, so, so authority control data is something that uh, is used a lot in uh, Wikipedia, uh, but also in Wikidata. And uh, what it means is Wikipedia, of course, had to rely on primary, um, secondary, tertiary um, uh, citations. And these citations come from places that we can trust, hence authority. And uh, what kind of sources we can trust, right? It has to be, um, it, it has to come from um, a publication that is well trusted, that is well regarded. Uh, it has to come from publications that have uh, presence for a long time uh, and don't publish things that are extremely biased. Um, biases itself is subjective, but that apart, um, authority control data has to come from a reliable source, basically. And uh, if you think of how knowledge is created, curated, shared across the world, we know one thing, that those who have been historically dominant have the power to uh, curate knowledge. And it changes in different uh, ways, in different contexts. In my own country, India, um, uh, the community that have been historically dominant have uh, made sure that the knowledge that is produced by the historically marginalized communities is erased, is repressed, and they have also made sure that they are able to appropriate knowledge that is produced by the historically marginalized communities. And uh, unfortunately, I come from the historically dominant community in my country. So I'm the, um, uh, pardon me, uh, my language, I'm the white person, I'm the white guy in my own country's context. Um, so what that means is my community has historically repressed uh, and erased the knowledge of many other communities. And that is about 80% of the country's population today, right? Um, and, you know, of course, there is provincial uh, difference and so on. Um, so that changes everything because what we trust as knowledge, what we trust as reliable sources are the repositories that are well guarded by people with historical um, authority. And uh, what we see as authoritative sources or what we or who we know as authoritative uh, representatives um, are the people that are the oppressors, uh, my people. And uh, because of that, the cultural, the cultural sector has uh, suffered a lot because many artisans um, and artists in general are from historically marginalized communities. In India's context, it's the nomadic tribe communities, it's the Dalit communities, it's the Shudra communities, and so on. Um, all, the, all the communities that are in the lower level of the uh, socioeconomic um, pyramid, and uh, they often don't have access to those repos repositories, 
that have been curating knowledge. So the Brahmin community, which is my community in India, has made sure that uh, the temples, the Hindu temples, um, do not allow certain uh, ethnic communities inside of the temple. And uh, mostly all the historical documents and things that are um, preserved for posterity were preserved inside the temples. So what that uh, meant is when all the other communities that produced knowledge, that uh, produced artworks, um, they would donate that or they would uh, work in low wages and then give it to uh, the Brahmins, who are the um, dominant communities, and then the Brahmins would curate these things inside, inside of the temples. So the temples are built by people that are not allowed inside the temples. Right? And that's, think of that in different contexts, and it is exactly that in the knowledge uh, sector. Um, so just, just to give a little bit of context what uh, uh, socioeconomic stratification I'm talking about, in India's context, there are four sort of main categories of uh, varnas, which are basically categories uh, based on uh, occupation, traditional occupation. Brahmins are the priests, Kshatriyas are the warriors, Vaishyas are the uh, business people, and Shudras are the ones that are serving all the three other communities. And then uh, the, these four communities are called um, Savarnas, or people that, have, that are part of one of the category. And uh, those who are outside of these four categories are called Dalits. And Dalits have always lived outside of the villages, they have forced to skin the cow, to um, use the skin for uh, making leather, and uh, to bury the dead. And they have historically been disallowed to come into any, any place that is uh, pure. Um, so hence, there is a lot of question of purity and impurity in food and in uh, what people wear, what pe how people talk, and so on. So purity in language, purity in culture, purity in um, food um, are quite uh, extremely present in India. Um, so much so that people ask really naive sounding questions, saying if you are a vegetarian or if you eat meat. And if you are a vegetarian, that basically means that you are a Brahmin. Um, and if you say that I, meet, I eat meat, then they would ask, what kind of meat do you eat? And if you say, if I, 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 I eat uh, pork and uh, beef, then that basically means that you're a Dalit. So it's very easy to, um, to, to socially oppress people in any um, place. Um, and it happens all the time um, in private spaces, in public spaces, and so on. Um, so um, now going back to artists and artisans. Uh, as I said, they mostly come from three, four different uh, large communities. The, um, the nomadic tribe communities particularly are very much into art, uh, performing art, uh, arts are predominantly uh, by these communities that move from place to place, don't have permanent houses, often live in tents, and uh, and hence the performing arts are performed by them in different places. They move uh, from place to place. And in fact, the Roma community um, in Europe, um, their ancestors uh, mostly traveled from the Indian states of Rajasthan and Gujarat. And uh, uh, those places in India are uh, very arid. So there's not much scope for uh, uh, agriculture. And uh, it was also forced uh, by the nature uh, on them. And uh, if, if you think about if you move all the way to the 21st century, right? Uh, we don't have colonization anymore, and we believe that we don't have colonization anymore. And uh, in the digital age, uh, particularly when we think of Wikipedia, uh, we have sort of very black and white rules. We had these rules that say that we have to cite, but we don't ask, has this information ever been curated by the people that have created the information? Right? Uh, people that have been artists, people that have been artisans, should have been the ones to curate that knowledge, should have been the uh, 
the, the, the perpetual sort of owner of the knowledge that their ancestors have created. But that's not the case. Here, uh, somebody else is deciding what is curated, how it is curated, whose name is added in those documents, and who is basically owning. Uh, often, a lot of artworks are attributed to kings and rulers, as if those kings and rulers were the ones to create. They actually forced people so much so that often there, there have been these urban myths that uh, the artisan's hands were cut or the fingers were uh, removed after they created a uh, particular art because they would not be able to create that again for another ruler, right? I, I mean, we, we can go back and verify which is um, true, which is not. But um, um, so, so, so this was at the back of my head uh, in 2021. Uh, when I was trying to create articles on Wikipedia about Indian artists, particularly from my own province, I found that there's very little information available uh, online, and uh, the information that's available online is mostly about artists from the dominant communities. So there we go back to the same loop. Um, those who have enjoyed that historical uh, access to all kinds of privileges were, were able to also influence the press and the media. And uh, their art has been uh, well critiqued, and there's good amount of information about them online. Um, and a lot of artists that come from uh, other historical marginalized communities had no information at all. Uh, fortunately, a friend of mine uh, who is an artist um, himself was working with a government agency, a provincial government agency, and he was making a list of all the um, visual artists from the province where, where I'm from in India. And uh, that was very helpful because the agency published it online. So this this is called the Odisha Lalit Kala Academy. And, uh, and because the government agency, Wikipedia can trust it. Um, so it was helpful in one way. Uh, but what I also found out is that the um, union list of artist names or the ULAN IDs that are used by uh, used on Wikidata, and then Wikipedia has an authority control template, uh, which basically goes at the end of the article to say that this particular artist can be trusted, um, doesn't exist for these artists. And uh, this, this uh, government agencies. Um, list had about uh, 700 artists. There were some duplicates here and there, but uh, roughly about 700 artists. And what I did is I reached out to the Getty Research Institute and asked them if they can create uh, new ULAN IDs for these artists. And they asked me what is the source of this, so I provided three sources, basically. So um, I had to clean up a lot of data uh, in the process. I had to uh, basically do a little bit of research to add more data, and it was a kind of semi manual process, but at the end I had a, a decently good uh, database that I shared with them, and then it, they took two years, to, uh, we went back and forth, I didn't have a Windows computer, um, and their software only works on Windows computers, so anyway, uh, in 2023, last year, we were able to create, they were able to create ULAN IDs for all the 700 artists. Now, what we're doing now is, um, we. I, I found out another uh, federal government um, uh, database that has more than 20,000 artists' details uh, that are from my province. But if you think of India, which has 30 provinces and um, several um, other smaller territories, there is probably 100,000 or more artists' detail, biographical details that is available. Now, all of those artists are notable. They're not the only artists that are there in the country. There are more artists, of course. But the government had created, the, the, uh, the, the federal government had created something called Pehchan ID, which is basically to provide each artist or artisan um, a unique ID that, that, um, that they can basically use for um, applying grants and uh, so on. So we have another identifier that can be added to the ULAN ID. So the wicked data at least will have two identifiers, one ULAN ID and one Pehjan ID number. So both those contribute a lot to make sure that those articles that are created about those um, uh, artists and artisans would not be deleted on Wikipedia. They can be challenged, but they would not be deleted. Often, 
uh, new editors don't know how to add information, what information to add, and uh, and this is a challenge. Um, so so that's that's where we are right now. We are working uh, basically to process um, all of that um, data. It's unclean. Um, in the sense, there is a lot of um, mistakes in terms of spelling. Uh, you know, the same people have multiple entries. There is honorifics that are added to some people's names, and there is no honorific. So the same uh, artist would have multiple entries in the database. All of that uh, can be fixed. Um, I'm using OpenRefine at the moment to clean some data. Uh, some manual, uh, basically going through the list and looking at names. Um, they're familiar names because I'm from the place. Um, yeah, this is a really, really small project in that sense. But I think there's there's a potential to collaborate with many other Wikipedians um, uh, just within India and grow. But I think there is also potential to think of other communities that have that share the same kind of challenges that India has, where um, there's historical oppression in, of many kinds, uh, be it colonization, be it post-colonial uh, oppression of any kind. Um, and uh, an artist and artisan details are not um, curated well. Uh, ULAN ID could be a really good starting point. Um, I, I personally i am not in favor of Wikipedia having these rules in the first place, where we trust only dominant um, uh, sources, but that's where we are. Um, and uh, if we just keep that aside, um, we still need uh, you know some amount of information about uh, these artists online. Um, so that's that's the end of my presentation. I think we have a little bit of time for um, conversations, questions, um, thoughts, uh, and if you have experienced similar things in your, in your context and what you're thinking about uh, an approach, um, and if you have done experiments like this before. Um, yeah, anything welcome. Yeah. Um, hey, thank you. So <clears throat> I think we have a similar situation in Bolivia. I'm from Bolivia. So I was wondering uh, what are your thoughts about uh, the majority of the artisan um, artisans of the past are anonymous. So, have you ever thought about it? Because in Bolivia we have a lot of artisans, but we don't know their names. Mm. Even, <clears throat> and we have the names of the artists, but we ha we don't have the name of the artisans. So I don't know if you uh, ever thought about it. Um, I, I I have thought about thought well partially about it because. Um, it's definitely a challenge to do primary research and use that primary research on Wikipedia, right? It's not allowed to begin with. And hence uh, this approach to create ULAN ideas in the first place. I don't think there's an easy way to dig out information that is erased or lost. Lost is a, is a very naive way to put it. It's mostly erased, it's mostly repressed, um, and uh, yeah, it's good to call a spade a spade. Um, I, I don't think there's a, there's an easy way to um, document that information that that we can find out. Um, and anonymity is something that most artists are against. They want to be attributed. Um, I, I have worked with some artists and I've always seen this. Artists always want to be attributed. There are only a few artists that don't want to be attributed for whatever reason, you know, be it... Uh, scrutiny from the government or something of that kind. But, but generally speaking, artists uh, want to be attributed and artisans want to be attributed. Um, yeah, uh, I, don't think, I don't think that we have an answer. I, per I personally don't have an answer. Anyone in the audience might. Yeah. Okay. I have been listening to your presentation of interest and I thought exactly about the Roma community in Poland because when I was uh, writing some articles about, about the Roma community in, in Poland, I have noticed that uh, there is a problem that uh, various important personalities of this community, they appear in those official uh, sources like you have mentioned in the context of the authority con control data only under the like uh, Polish given names that don't have any connection to 
uh, the 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 Roma community community and I I I I I I'm wondering whether you have some ideas how to work, for example, with some more Roma associations in Poland to combat that and to include in those uh, databases those uh, indigenous Roma names into those official records in, in, in Poland? Um, m maybe just one sort of technical um, information here. Um, the Getty Research Institute mostly works with nonprofits and um, I co-founded a nonprofit in 2017 with a f few fellow Wikipedians. Um, and we used the organization uh, for this purpose. Um, they, they sign an agreement, uh, a non-financial agreement with an organization where you become the data provider and this, uh, this institute or this um, uh, organization could be that um, sort of collaborator, uh, a partner with Getty Institute. And, uh, and then they have sort of a long process, a longish process. They need data in a particular format. So they have a template and it has to exactly match that because that would be ingested into their system uh, in, as, as a bulk, um, uh, as a whole database. Uh, yeah, so I think it is possible to put them in touch together, uh, right? And then uh, I don't know if you're part of Wikimedia um, Poland, but that could also be another partner organization. And uh, yeah, as an outcome of that partnership would be creating this database and then sending that to Getty and then Getty would process that, and they would um, they would also attribute uh, this or this organization. So if there are particular individuals or uh, the entire group that need to be attributed, uh, they would attribute uh, on every single ULN ID. And uh, yeah, once that is available, uh, you know we we have uh, on this end uh, on Wikidata's end we have ways to access their API and update the artist name. So that's what I did. Once I created, once they created the ULAN IDs, or, sorry, before they created the ULAN IDs, I had created the Wikidata uh, Wikidata entry for each artist, and I had included the Wikidata QID in each dark artist data. So what the moment ULAN, uh, the moment Getty created the ULAN IDs, they also added the Wikidata ID, and both are linked data uh, databases, right? It's it's easier for them to speak to each other, um, and then yeah, uh, that that's very very helpful. Because tomorrow, if there's, there'll be a secondary database that will be uh, created, then they will have two IDs to begin with. Yeah, so that can be easily done. I have a bit of a related question also about um, ROM people in Germany. Um, you were in the lucky position that you had those lists from the government. Yes. Um, so often these kind of lists don't exist for other groups and often it's small organizations that already exist that are yeah. trying to gather that information. Does Getty Images take also information data from such self? I mean, they are doing what you said, we can't do the original research. Yeah. But if it's just a small organization that is doing original research, would it be possible to create ULAN IDs from such lists that are gathered by smaller organizations? By, um, yeah. Uh, the, What's the, their level where they say? Yeah, the, the short answer to that is uh, in my 13, 14 years of um, being a Wikipedian, one thing that I've learned is you have to be very, very persistent and uh, yeah, just keep bothering people in a nice way. And they would eventually uh, understand that you bring, um, yeah, good amount of good wealth of knowledge, uh, irrespective of the organization size. Being an individualist is tricky, maybe, but finding an organization that would be the host organization and sign this agreement, uh, I don't think that would be really hard. The agreement is just um, sort of a technical. Um, part of the process, but I think yeah, finding an organization that will be a host organization, and it will be really nice to find an organization that kind of represents the community, the artist community in this case. Um, this was this is an institute that the government institute basically supports artists um, financially, um, you know, in training and so on. But yeah, I, I think it is possible to find an institution and and do that collaboration. 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, continuing uh, from that, uh, I, I think uh, institutions like Getty, uh, they want a, a, an authoritative, stable source yeah. for this data, but I don't think they would insist, or if they do, I think that can be negotiated yeah. on, on a formal nonprofit or you know yes. certificate. That doesn't matter. What matters is that you convince them that you do have a method that yeah. you have reasonable stability, that you are t have taken steps to, to deduplicate or to, you know, yeah. to figure out uh, pseudonyms. And, you know, like they want to know yeah. how, what, what quality is your data. Yeah. And so even where uh, you're not as lucky as Subhashish to have had kind of a, a, a seed of, of high quality data, uh, you could find partners, you could find even, even a, a collective of independent scholars who decide to start documenting their process, their method, can eventually produce, and as you say, persistence, right? It takes yeah. time, but you can eventually produce something that would be considered good enough to rely on, and these things feed each other, right? Even, even yeah. your creating the Wikidata entity helped yeah. the Yulan people feel better about, yeah. okay, I'm not just creating some Yulan number that links to nothing. And they like Wikidata. It links to Wikidata. That, that's what I'm saying. Wikidata yeah. has arrived yeah. in the sense that serious librarians and serious information uh, science people treat it as a legitimate uh, uh, source to link to, to rely on. So we, we have a stake in this. We as Wikimedians have a stake in this. Yeah. And partnering with the right people who have more access to the primary material can, can really, be, uh, can really do, do a lot that the Getty people and the more institutional part of the authority control universe may, may get to only later. Like we might be in a better position to yeah. make it happen just, just as you have. I think that's a great model project for, for people to no, thank you. That, that's a really good summary. Okay, uh, time is up. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.